Well, good morning and a very warm welcome to you here. It's Sunday the 12th of September here at Norton Lane. A very warm welcome if this is your first time or you're visiting with us. A special warm welcome if this is your first time watching uh, live with us on YouTube. Everything you need for the service is just underneath the screen you'll find there on the website. And if this is your first time and you want to find out more about us as a church, then on our YouTube channel you can click the link to our website there as well. You're all welcome to stay behind for tea and coffee and biscuits just out the back, just through this door and out the back will be straight after the morning service and again this evening as well. There's a few uh, notices to go through for this week on the order of service, which you haven't got one yet, it's just by the hand gel as you came in. Uh, Lord willing, this evening I'll be preaching here in the evening, we'll continue our series through Haggai. And Lord willing, next Sunday I'll be preaching in the morning and evening on the 19th. And in the evening we will celebrate the Lord's Supper. This Wednesday at half past one we'll have our, our next ladies Bible study. That'll be on Zoom. Please uh, see Megan or, or Alice if you'd like to, to join that. That's at half past one, the ladies Bible study. And this Wednesday, the 15th, at 7.45, we have a special meeting, a special prayer meeting. It's our next joint churches prayer meeting with ourselves and Wadden Road in the north of Cheltenham and Gloucester Presbyterian Church, where we'll have a speaker from Spain, Jose de Segovia. He's a a church minister uh, in Madrid, and he's going to come and talk to us about his work there on Wednesday. So do come. If you don't usually come to the Wednesday prayer meetings, then I would encourage you to come this Wednesday to hear about the work of the gospel in Spain. That's this Wednesday, 7.45, here in the building. Thursday, we have our next men's fellowship, which would be 7.45 at our house. See the address there. If you've never been before and you're a man and you're very welcome, and if you haven't got a copy of the book, Discovering God... Well, we'll be looking at chapter 11, then let me know and I can get you a copy. And then Friday we have our Jam Club, that's our primary age uh, children's club, here from 4 till 5. Our notices for today. Let's hear our call to worship as we come to worship our God together from Philippians 2, 9 to 11. This is the one for whom we worship whom we praise, for whom every knee shall bow. Let's hear our call to worship. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. To the glory of God the Father. As we worship today, let us pray. Our gracious and our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity, we thank you and praise you that we can gather to worship you today, young and old, boy and girl, male and female, whoever we are, wherever we've come from, We belong to you. We are your people, the sheep of your pasture. You know us all by name. And you've gathered us here together today to worship you. Please help us and bless us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We sing our first hymn of praise together this morning. Come people of the risen King who delight to bring him praise. Please stand and sing when the music starts.
Let us continue in worship as we pray together. Our glorious King, the loveliest all, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Saviour, one who was born of the Virgin Mary, one who grew in wisdom and in favour with God and with man, one who lived the perfect, sinless, spotless life, not one iniquity may be found in him, in thought, in word, in deed. The one who was handed over to the rulers and the authorities. The one who suffered under Pontius Pilate. The one who was crucified, buried, and the one who rose again in victory. The one who is our Lord and our King, our risen Saviour who in his death and his burial and resurrection <coughs> our enemies have been defeated. The price has been paid for our salvation. Proof in his resurrection that the sacrifice, that price has been accepted so that in him we have life. We have forgiveness of sins. We have guilt removed. We have our debts paid. We thank you and praise you for the Lord Jesus Christ. Help us to give our lives as a living offering to serve him, the one who knows us, who loves us, who cares for us. Let us give our lives to serve our risen and glorious King. We pray for your help. We pray that you will help us. In Jesus' name. Amen. It's wonderful to praise our God together. Let us also confess our sin together, which you'll find on the order of service. Our confession today, this week, is from Ephesians 2. Ephesians 2, verses 1 to 3. And you'll see the assurance of our forgiveness is the next part of that wonderful passage that Paul wrote to the Ephesian church from 2, 4 to 7. So let us confess our sin together in Ephesians 2, 1 to 3. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. Now here, the wonderful assurance of our forgiveness, the glory of the gospel that follows that passage. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised up with him and, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Amen. Now is the time in our service for our children's talk. The very important uh, question for you this morning, children, there may be lots of different answers. Let's see what you think. Who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? William, who is Jesus? Have a think. Nearly. Have a think, Hannah. That's right. He is the Son of God. That's right. Who else is Jesus? Any other ideas? William. The Holy Spirit. That's different. Hannah. The king. Ah, I've got that picture. He is the king, isn't he? That's right. He is the king. Who is Jesus? 
What if I showed you this? William. That's right, he's the creator. He made the whole world. He's the king, he's the son of God. He's the creator. He made the whole world, didn't he? In Genesis 1, it's Jesus. He is the creator, the word of God, through which all things came into existence. Jesus is the king, the creator, the son of God. Any other ideas? Don't worry. There's plenty of other things. You can talk about that over the dinner table later on. Now, if Jesus is the king... And he's also the creator of the whole world. When he came to earth, where would you expect him to live? Would it be somewhere like this? Anyone know where this is? Where's this, Hannah? It is in London. Anyone know the name of this very big and important building? Yes, Josh? It is a palace. Anyone know the name of this palace, William? No. Anyone know, Hannah? Buckingham Palace. That's right. And who lives in Buckingham Palace? William. The Queen. The Queen. That's right. And one day it might be a king who lives in Buckingham Palace. That's right. And do you think it's quite a nice place to live in Buckingham Palace? You probably get lost in Buckingham Palace. There's a lot of people wandering around taking pictures in Buckingham Palace. But it's quite a nice place to live, isn't it? If the king, the king lives in Buckingham Palace, the Queen, then they'd have they'd have lots of servants and butlers and people bringing them tea and and turning the pages of their newspaper every morning and cleaning their teeth and combing their hair and choosing their clothes. A lot of things like that, wouldn't it? Well, we just said Jesus is the king, and he's not just the king of this country, is he? He's the king of the whole world, isn't he? If he made the whole world, it's his. But it doesn't stop there, does it? Because Jesus didn't just make the world. What else did Jesus make? William. He made everything, didn't he? All the stars, the planets. He's the king of the whole universe. And the moon. But do you know what? Let me show you something else. What's this? What's this, Josh? A towel. What what do you do with a tea towel? Put it out, get things out of the oven with it, yes. Yeah, well, what, what else do you do if your hands are all wet, Hannah? That's it, you dry your hands, you might dry up some, some plates and spoons and things. It's, it's for use for cleaning, isn't it? And uh, what's this? It says, uh, Matthew is the master chef. <laughs> what? This was a present, not, not self bought. What's this, William? Um, this, um, I put it on like this, you see. An apron, isn't it? That's right. And who might wear an apron? Hannah. A chef. And what does the chef do? Clara. Cook things. That's right. Now, do you think the Queen in Buckingham Palace, she might do, do you think that she would have her own tea towel and she would wash up all the 50 different plates from a big state banquet and she'd be there drying up each one and, and cleaning the table? Do you think she'd do that? No, she'd got lots of servants to do that. Do you think the queen would go into her, her royal kitchen and put on her apron with queen written on it? Do you think that she'd put that on and start peeling potatoes? Would she do that? Would she act as a servant? No. No. But do you know which king did do that? Josh. Which king? Which king have we just been talking about? Hannah. Jesus. Jesus did that. See, he is the king of the whole universe. He has all power. He's in charge of the whole world. Right now, 
he rules. He is the king. And yet he came not to be served, as you would expect the king to be, with lots of waiters and servants. But he came as a servant. He came as a servant. He washed the disciples' feet. He taught them. He made people better. And most wonderfully, it says in the passage we're going to be looking at today, he came to give his life. To serve by giving his life that those who believe and trust in him might be forgiven, might have life. So Jesus, the greatest king, came as the greatest servant and the one that we need. Thank you for listening, children. We're going to come to pray again now, and then we'll sing again before we look at God's word this morning. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you and praise you for the wonderful gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, our King, who came to serve, not his friends, but those who are alienated from you, those who were sinners, those who were guilty. He came to die to save sinners. We thank you and praise you, you who have been chosen in Christ before the world began, who have been enabled by your Spirit to believe. We thank you that we belong to Jesus Christ and for this wonderful gospel, then in him, Through his death, we have life. And Father, we pray that as we believe and hold dear in our hearts that wonderful gospel, that more people may hear it. In our area, as the leaflets have been going out, as as advertisements have been going out, as, as YouTube services are available, we pray that people in this local area who live across the street from us, who live next door to us, may respond, may come to faith in Christ, may be one day, we pray, be seated here with us, praying to you, joining in with our worship. We pray you do a great and a mighty work. We pray that through whatever the gospel is preached in this, in this town, in this county, that many will hear it who don't know you, that many will come to faith in Christ. So please build us up. Help us to grow in it in assurance of who we are and who we belong to. Help us to be thankful for the wonderful gospel that we have in Jesus Christ. We thank you for the beginning of our weekly activities again this week, in the last couple of weeks, for Ladies' Fellowship and Ladies' Bible Study for Jam Club on Friday and prime time yesterday. Thank you for all who came and we pray that, that many who maybe have been intended to come will come next time. That people will invite others to come and, and hear the good news of Jesus Christ to join in with fellowship. That you will use these ministries to build us up, up the children, those of more mature years, of ladies and, and men. We pray for the men's group this week but also for those who don't know you. Father, we pray for our brother Chris and Julie, and as they're at St. Mary's this morning, that dear congregation, though very small in number, we pray that you'll be with him and speak through him and bless him, that they might be an encouragement to them. We pray for Courtney as he's preaching down in Morton today. Please watch over him and give him travelling mercies. Thank you for him and his love for you and and for service. We pray for Stephen on his way up to Northern Ireland. Please keep him safe. May he have good time with his family over there. Father, we pray for those who are sick and unwell. That you will sustain and strengthen them and provide for all they need. And we pray for our government at this time when COVID cases seem to be rising as schools have gone back with the situation in Afghanistan and and other things, we pray you'll give them wisdom and provide for them at this time. Father, we give these things to you. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Before we come to read God's word together, we're going to sing a part of Psalm 19, which is all about the word of God. The law of the Lord is perfect and sound, for with it the soul is revived and crowned. Let us stand and sing to God's praise. We come to read our two passages from the Word of God this morning. We're going to read Daniel chapter 9, verses 9 to 14, and then the section from Mark's Gospel that, the, we, that you have on the order of service, Mark 10, 43 to 45. The reason we're looking at Daniel chapter 7 is because one of the favourite ways that Jesus referred to himself is as the Son of Man. And this passage from Daniel chapter 7 refers and talks about who the Son of Man is. And so it's very relevant for our passage today in Mark chapter 10, 43 to 45. So let us hear the word of God, starting with Daniel chapter 7. As I looked... Thrones were placed, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames, its wheels were burning fire. A stream of fire and came out from before him. A thousand thousand served him. And ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. And the court sat in judgment, and the books were opened. I looked then, because of the sound of the great words that the horn was speaking. And as I looked, the beast was killed, and its body destroyed and given over to be burned with fire. As for the rest of the beasts, their dominion was taken away, but their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. And he came to the Ancient of Days, and was presented before him, and to him was given dominion and glory, and a kingdom, that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, 
and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. And then the passage from Mark chapter 10, 43 and 45. But it shall not be so among you, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Before we come to consider this wonderful portion of God's word this morning, let us pray. Our glorious God, we thank you as we sung earlier that your law and your word are perfect, reviving the soul, thrilling the heart. Please help us now as we, as we study your word together, this glorious portion of your word which explains our great hope and the wonder of the gospel. Help us to understand it and let us treasure up these words in our heart. In Jesus' name, amen. It was George Orwell in Animal Farm, who Napoleon, one of the pigs, who wrote on the wall, so everyone can see, all animals are equal, but some are more equal than others. And you think, well, what's that got to do with anything? Well, as we come to the Bible, as we come to the Word of God, our foundation, our authority, it's all equally the word of God, all equal in holiness and authority and in inspiration, infallibility, equal in glory. But there are some passages which are to be more treasured than others, which are more important, which are more wonderful. It's like you're eating a good meal. I don't know what you've got planned to have for lunch today. But when you put the meal out on your plate, you might have some potatoes and some chicken, some gravy. You might have some vegetables. This all equally good for you. But you might really like that Brussels sprout or that piece of chicken or that crispy skin. There's some part of that meal which is more wonderful. It's like a diamond compared to all other rocks. It might weigh the same. It's made of the same kind of stuff. But there's something about a diamond which catches your eye, which is more precious and more wonderful. And when we come to this passage, this verse in Mark chapter 10, we've come to one of the most important passages in Mark's gospel. One of the most important passages of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. As we've been studying Mark's gospel, we've seen many wonderful and glorious things. But when we come to this verse here, we have Jesus himself explaining not just who he is, but why he's come. He says it explicitly, and clearly, like passages we have in Luke 19 as well, with the story of Zacchaeus, when Jesus says, I have come to seek and save the lost. Again, Jesus explaining his mission, his purpose. John 3.16, John saying, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. And whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. You come across passages, verses like that, which so clearly explain the gospel, so clearly explain our hope and who Jesus is and why he came, that instead of covering a large portion of scripture this morning, we're going to slow down. We're going to look at that one verse, Mark 10, 45. For even the Son of Man 
came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. We're going to slow down. We're going to savour it. We're going to meditate on it and enjoy it. Like you would your favourite part. Like the, the oyster or the parson's nose or whatever you call it. That part of the chicken which is the most delicious. You don't want to wolf it down quickly but you want to delight in it bit by bit. Enjoy it. So that's what going to do today with Mark 10, 45. I've called this, that this passage is the key. This verse is the key to understanding three things. It's the key to understanding Christ. It's the key to understanding the gospel. And it's also, within the context that we looked at last week, which we'll cover and talk about later on, it's also the key to understanding discipleship, the Christian life. So let's have a look at this passage then. Firstly, it's the key to understanding Christ the key to understanding Christ. In this day, when Mark was writing to the Christians in Rome, to the the context that Jesus was in at the time, to our day now, there are lots of opinions about who Jesus is. You ask anybody on the street, you come out from here and you say, who do you think Jesus is? And, And most people, if not everybody, would have heard of Jesus, maybe from Christmas or Easter, And they all have some kind of idea of who he is. He lived a long time ago. He was a a good teacher. He was someone who died on the cross. Someone who we celebrate as a little baby at Christmas. And here, remember back in chapter 8, Jesus asked the disciples, who do you say that I am? And they say, well, some people say you're Elijah. Others say one of the prophets. So again, even when Jesus was On earth, there are lots of people having different ideas of who he is. But they also had lots of common perceptions about who the Christ would be and what the Messiah or the Christ would come to do. That's why we read from Daniel chapter 7. That was one of the the common ideas and kind of pictures that when the Christ comes, he's going to be like that in Daniel chapter 7. He's going to be given a kingdom. He's going to be glorious. He's going to have all authority and honour. He's going to be praised and served by all nations. That's who the Christ, that's who the Messiah is going to be like that. They would have thought of passages as well to Samuel chapter 7. When God makes David a promise, say, you're not going to build me a house, I'm going to build you a house, a dynasty. In fact, one of your offspring will be king and his kingdom shall never end. So when they think of the Christ, like a word association game, when they say Christ, they would think glory, honour, power, rule. Someone who would come and and get rid of the Romans, would come and lead a rebellion. Like in the period between the Old Testament and the New Testament, there are a couple of those, like the Maccabees. They think that's going to happen again, but even greater, not just get rid of the Greeks, but get rid of the Romans, where all the nations will serve him. They had this idea of what the Messiah would be. He'd be the Son of Man in all glory, authority, and power who'd be served and waited on and worshipped by all. Jesus says that even the Son of Man came not to be served, came not to be waited upon, came not to be worshipped and bowed down before at this time, but he came to serve And to give his life as a ransom for many. Because this verse tells us a lot about who Jesus is. He's the one who came into the world. In saying that, he means, he's saying, I'm the one who existed before I was born. I came, I wasn't created afresh and anew. I'm pre-existent. 
John 1, John, one of the disciples in the previous passage who was arguing about who's going to sit at the right and, and the left-hand side of Jesus, says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning, and that Word became flesh, came into the world, the one who was before all things, through whom all things were made, Paul writes in Colossians 1. But there's another dimension that they miss out from the Old Testament about who this Messiah, who this Christ would be. You go to the prophecy of Isaiah and there's four servant songs about this this figure called the servant of the Lord in 42 and 49, 50 and 52 of Isaiah. One who would come and preach, who would be gentle and lowly, who would come to be a servant. And we read things which are very similar to what we read in the New Testament in Isaiah 50 verse 6. It says... I gave my back to those who strike, and my cheeks to those who pull out the beard. I hid not my face from disgrace and spitting. And what does Jesus say in 33 and 34 of Mark 10, earlier on? And he foretells what's going to happen to him when he gets to Jerusalem. He says in 34, and they will mock him. And they will spit on him. And they will flog him. And after three days, he and kill him. After three days, he will rise again. Jesus is showing, in not just foretelling what's going to happen, that he's going to be handed over, that he's going to be killed, that he is also, yes, he's the Christ. He is the Son of Man. He's the servant of the Lord. In Isaiah 53, that famous, wonderful passage... Read very similar language that Jesus uses as well. It says in verse 12, Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressions, transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. Very similar language that we have here in Mark 10. He gave his life as a ransom for many. So from this verse, this one verse, yes, we get the glorious side of who Christ is, the Son of Man, the Messiah, but he's also the suffering servant. He's also the one who in order to receive, like we read at the beginning of the service from Philippians chapter 2, before he is exalted and every knee shall bow and confess that he is Lord, just before that passage is his humiliation. He took on the form of a servant, became obedient to death, even death on the cross. And so yes, Christ will be exalted He is now seated at the the right-hand side of God. But before that comes his humiliation, comes him suffering, comes his being mocked and spit on and flogged and being handed over to die and be killed. The one who would be that light to the Gentiles would come has come in humility to serve at the will of God, the Lamb of God who is about to be slaughtered. It's a big surprise for the people here. Have this idea of you of course you can't be the Christ. Look at you. There's no crown, there's no palace, there's no splendor, there's no army. How can you be the Christ? Like going to Buckingham Palace and you sit in the cafe and it's the queen who comes over wearing an apron, wearing a little hairnet, 
and she serves you tea and coffee and asks if you like any sugar. But even more than that, she comes into your house, says, let me do your washing. Let me take this to the laundrette. Let me iron and hoover for you. Let me make you lunch. Let me wash up. That'd be a big surprise, wouldn't it? A huge surprise. And so for the people here, for the disciples, hearing again as Jesus is not the first time, hearing again and again, yes, I am the Son of Man, but the Son of Man, who as we sing at Christmas and hark the herald angels sing, Christ by highest heaven adored, Christ the everlasting Lord, late in time, behold him come, offspring of the virgin's womb, veiled in flesh, the Godhead see. In the, in, in the transfiguration, just weeks before this, in the passage in chapter 9, they got a glimpse of who Jesus really is. Radiant, bright, dazzling in glory. Jesus has come first to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. See, this passage here, this verse, is the key to understanding the whole Christ. Yes, he's the one with ultimate power and authority who deserves all worship. But he came into the world not dressed in regal clothes, not obviously the king. He didn't come with an army. He came as a servant. He came not to be served. But he came to get down on the floor and he came to wash the disciples' feet. He came to go to the cross. And he came willingly. He wasn't forced or pushed. He came willingly to do the work of his Father in heaven. It's the key to understanding Christ. Like you go up to Mount Snowdon and there's two peaks. Where in Mark's Gospel there's also two peaks. There's chapter 8, verse 29, when Peter confesses, You are the Christ. You are the promised one. You are the one we've been waiting for. You are the one that the whole Old Testament has been pointing towards. He's coming. He's coming. And after 400 years of silence, he's here. You are that one. You are the serpent crusher. You are the offspring of Abraham. You are the son of David. But then we have the other peak here in 1045. Yes, I am that one, but I am the one who's come to serve and give my life as a ransom for many. So who is Jesus? He is the servant king. He is the eternal son of God who came humbly to serve. So firstly, this passage gives us the key to understanding who Christ is. But that's all, all it gives us understanding for. You might be asking, but well, well, why? Why did the eternal Son of God, the King of Kings, the one enthroned on high, why did he come not to be served as, as he deserves to be, and that wouldn't be arrogant or proud to expect that? Why did he come to be served and, and not, and why did he come to serve and, and not to be served? Why and what for? You may be, no, not this, this probably never happened to you, but imagine if you're walking on the coast and, and someone, just you're on the cliff and someone runs up to you and says, I'm doing this for you and they go and jump off the cliff. You'd be, well, why? You'd be puzzled, wouldn't you? Very puzzled. And so this, Jesus came for a reason. That's why, secondly, it gives us the key to understanding the gospel. The key to understanding the good news. You see that word that Jesus uses to give his life as a ransom. As a ransom, not just to give his life for many. Thinking, well, that's lovely, but why? Here's the reason. To give his life as a ransom for many. Now you may be, you may, 
when you hear the word ransom, and you think, okay, well, a price for release. Maybe someone's in a hostage situation, and, they, and the kidnappers, they ask for a ransom. You pay this money, and that person can be released. It's a, a, a ransom price, a price to release people from a hostage or hostile situation where they are captive. And in the Old Testament, there's, there's other uses for ransom as well for this same word. In Exodus 21, 30, it's a price that some would pay compensate compensation if they committed a crime to kind of cover that crime they committed. In Leviticus 25, it's a, a price that would be paid if, if someone owed so much money, they were in so much debt, and they couldn't afford to pay that debt back. Then they'd have to sell off their land and their property. And this ransom would be given to buy that back. In Exodus, in fact, it describes the Exodus. In Exodus 6.6, 6, God's deliverance. God's liberating his people who were captive in Egypt as slaves. God's releasing them and bringing them out. It's the price of release from captivity, from slavery. Price of a crime. Price to buy back someone who's lost or something that's lost. You think, well, what, why is that good news? What's that got to do with anything? I'm, I'm not a slave. I'm not in debt. I'm not captive or a hostage. But the Bible is clear. That spiritually, we are alienated from God. Slaves to desires and lusts. Slaves to sin. To disobedience, to rejecting God. Under condemnation. Romans 3, no one is good, not even one. We are guilty. Debtors. If people in debt, maybe with credit cards, and they, but they're able to pay it off, just like £100 a month. But could you pay off a billion pounds? Like someone, like in Ephesians 2, which we read from earlier. Dead in trespasses and sins. Imprisoned under death's rule and reign. In a courtroom declared guilty before a holy God. And this is the bad news, isn't it? The gospel, in order to be good news, always starts with the bad news. You are helpless. You are condemned and under judgment. Romans 3, Paul writes, All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All deserving punishment, hell and judgment. Since Adam, from Genesis 3, when sin came in the world, when they were kicked out of the garden, away from fellowship with God, we've been alienated from him. And that's the bad news, this spiritual debt and poverty. But that's where the good news comes, doesn't it? That's why Jesus came. That's why he came into the world, to give his life as a ransom for many. Because God so loved the world, he sent his only son, the son of man, to give his life as a ransom, the price to be paid, the price that was owed, that was paid publicly at the cross. That those who are guilty, those who could not pay, those who were imprisoned, the price has been paid for their release. The debt has been cleared. The sin has been forgiven and wiped away. Hostages who are captive to sin have been set free. Imagine you're on death row. We don't have it in this country anymore. But in America, if you've ever seen the film The Green Mile, and you're on death row, and sometimes you can be there for, for years, just awaiting. You know you're guilty. The sentence has been given. 
But imagine someone opens your cell door and say, off you go. It's done. Not, don't worry, we swept it under the rug, just sh- go out quietly. But no, the, 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 the death penalty that you owe, someone else has done it for you. They've died in your place. You are free. That punishment has been taken. That crime has been paid for. Justice has been done. You imagine, you're free now. You're, not, you're no longer under any condemnation. I bet that person would rejoice and skip and dance and, and run out of there. Not, not, not waiting, not, it's not just delayed. Okay, you go on holiday for a few years. No, that's it. You are no longer guilty. You've been released. And that's the wonderful good news of the gospel. We who are under condemnation, who are deserving of punishment, who are guilty before a holy God, who owed a huge debt, which we could never pay. We could never earn our way out. We could never work our way out of the guilt that we are under. And it says, you can't do it, I will. And so the Son of Man, the Lord Jesus Christ, became flesh to bear our iniquities, to take that punishment, to provide complete satisfaction for our sin, to pay that debt. He, God is both just and the justifier. He's both just and generous. You owe this. I can't just forget it, but I will send my Son to pay that price in your place. And it's not just for one, is it? It's as a ransom for many. As a ransom for many. People from every tribe, every tongue, every race. See, this is the glorious and wonderful good news of the gospel. Yes, I am a great sinner. But I have a great saviour in Jesus Christ who came to give his life as a ransom for many. To give his life in that glorious exchange to purchase my freedom. A people to be cleansed and set free, forgiven, under no condemnation. Who can condemn the people of God. And so we praise God. We give thanks for this most valuable and precious truth that we hold on to. There was no question about whether Jesus would do this. Do you remember from the beginning of this section in 1032, Jesus was striding ahead. He was walking in front of them. Not being pushed, not being dragged. Come on, get on the cross for us. You need to do this because we can't. No, he was going straight to Jerusalem. His eyes fixed that he was going to give his life in exchange for sinners. To die to save those who were guilty. To purchase for himself a people and a kingdom. This is... This passage, the key to understanding the gospel. It starts with bad news. But there is wonderful and glorious good news in Jesus Christ. So are you one of the many? Have you believed and trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ? Are you resting upon him alone for your salvation? Jesus knows how to serve. He knows you. He knows what you need. Because he is exactly and all that you need. We've seen this verse gives us the key to understanding Christ. The key to understanding the gospel. And third and finally, more briefly, the key to understanding discipleship. How are those who have been purchased, 
How are those who have been set free? How are those who have been forgiven, whose debts have been wiped out, who have been completely absolved of their, of their guilt and crime, how are they to live? Remember the context. Remember you have James and John walking with Jesus. And they ask Jesus the question, say, Lord, can we, we want you to do whatever we ask. And Jesus says, well, what do you ask? What we are, I want to sit on your right, and, and my brother James, he wants to sit on your left. We want positions of authority and power. We want to lord it o- over others. We want other people to honour and to serve us. And what Jesus does is he doesn't just do what the creation of Ofsted did in 1992, which is to raise the standard of education. He doesn't just raise the standard of living. He creates a whole new standard. He says, no, greatness, true greatness is not in how many people serve you, but in how many people you serve. It's not in what you get, but it's in what you give. It says, to follow me. I'm giving you, yes, the means of your salvation, but also the model of what it means to live in my kingdom. The model disciple, that's who I am as well as the means to becoming disciples. This is the way of the kingdom. It's not a new ethical system, but it is the way of the Lord. It's giving your life as Jesus gave his for the utmost benefit and the good of others. Serving by giving. We can do that by giving our time by visiting or cooking for or helping or calling or texting others. We can serve by giving financially to meet the needs of others around us, to support the work of the church. We can serve by using the gifts the Lord's given us. Like Jesus, not for our own glory, but for the good and for the benefit of others as obedient and willing servants. As Jesus died so that others may have life. And so the key to understanding discipleship is that we might die to self, to our own wants and desires, that we may enhance and bless the lives of others. We've seen the key to understanding Christ, the key to understanding the gospel. And lastly, we've seen the key to understanding discipleship. So this verse, for the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many is one we should treasure as Mary treasured up what the shepherds told her about who this baby was to be. So we should treasure up this verse, memorize it, print it off and and put it on our walls. For this is who our Lord and King is. This is the great gospel in which we depend upon and which we are so thankful for because without it we have no hope. But this is also the key to understanding how we are to live. And John did understand it. John, one of the ones who was asking Jesus, says in John 13, John, the same John, John 13, 34, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You are also to love one another. By all this, people will know that you are my disciples. And John also writes in John 3, 16, By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our life for our brothers. And may God help us to know 
the privilege of being known, of being served, and of living for the glory of our servant King Jesus Christ, who will, when he returns, welcome us with open arms, lead us to that feast that he has prepared, and who will say again, Come and sit down, let me serve you. Behold, this is your king. This is what he's like. This is what he's done. What a joy it is to be a Christian and to belong to him. Amen. Let's pray together. <clears throat> Our gracious and heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for the Lord Jesus Christ. May these truths that we've thought about this morning, may they cause our hearts to dance and to delight in him, to praise and to give thanks to you. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to come and sing our final hymn this morning. O come, O come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel. Let us stand and sing when the music begins.
People of God, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forever. Amen.